All right, if you have a Bible with you, open it up to Daniel chapter 1. That's where we're going to get to today. Daniel chapter 1. Last week we, we, we started a series called Unstoppable Faith. And we're, we're just taking these next really eight weeks from here on out, we're going to be studying the incredible life of Daniel. So if you missed last week's message, you can go online, you can listen to it still, and I challenge you to do that. Um, but at least you're here for really week one of getting into this guy's life. And when I think about faith, we, we talk about as, as Christians a lot of times, we talk about faith. And when I think about faith, there's always one name that comes to mind, and that's this guy, Daniel. Daniel had some of the most incredible faith I've ever seen in anybody. So I hope as, as we're going along through this series that uh, just keep reading through Daniel. I, I challenged you last week to just take a chapter a day and read Daniel. And, and for the next eight weeks, read Daniel, chapter a day. You'll get through the book a, a couple times there, and, and it'll kind of keep you apprised to where we're going in this series and everything else. Now, we're not necessarily working through the book of Daniel. We're looking at Daniel's life, but that's in the book of Daniel. So we'll be in the book of Daniel for, for these next eight weeks also. So we started this journey of looking at Daniel's absolute unstoppable faith. And I said last week, at least I think I did, I said there's more adventure there's more political intrigue and raw courage in the real life of Daniel than in any life you would ever see, any Jason Bourne movie or, I don't know, Missy and I watched this movie last night, I don't recommend it because it was dumb. Uh, the Mummy, the newest one, uh, didn't like it at all. Um, so, I don't know, if you want another, it was basically just a remake of the first one, but worse. Um, but, you know, you see these adventures that you see on TV and in movies and everything else, and Daniel's life had more, and he went through it all for real. This guy, Daniel, was taken from his home when he was 15 years old. In about 600 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar led the, the, the Babylonian army into the nation of Israel and they destroyed it, basically leveled it all and, and took the, the best, the smartest, the, 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 the wisest, the, the best looking of these people in Israel, this nation of Israel, and they took 25% of them back to Babylon. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, where is Babylon at? Now, if you were to go to your map and you were to look on a map of the Middle East, Babylon is modern-day Iraq. I told you, I think, last week that actually when Saddam Hussein was, was in power, he was resurrecting the city of Babylon. He was rebuilding it, and he was stamping his face on all of the bricks that were being built to rebuild Babylon. I told you last week, if you go to the book of Revelation and you study anything in Revelation, you'll know and understand that Babylon is the center of everything that's going to be taking place in the end times. So it's very significant that Babylon would actually be rebuilt at this point in time in, in history. Of course, that's all stalled since Saddam Hussein is no longer in power and hasn't been for a while. But this book of Daniel and, and Daniel's life, this book spans 70 years of Daniel's life. We first meet Daniel at the age of 15, and he's being taken as really a prisoner of war, a POW, back to Babylon. He never sees his parents again. He never gets to go home again. He lives out his days in Babylon. But while all this is taking place in his life, Daniel keeps his integrity and keeps his faith intact. Every time he faces a new trial, Daniel rises above it. And as he rises above trial after trial after trial after trial, Daniel is promoted and promoted and promoted. Daniel's actually promoted five times throughout this book of, of Daniel and in his life. He served under three unbelieving emperors and actually led two of them to Christ. At age 85, Daniel becomes second in command only to the emperor himself. Tell me this guy isn't incredible. He's a POW, and before you know it, he's second in command. You see, from Daniel's model and Daniel's life, 
we can learn lessons from every stage of life. Whether you're young or old, Daniel's life has something to say to you. Today we begin to look at really the tests that Daniel is going to go through. Look with me at the top of your notes there at Proverbs 17.3. It says this, Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. And I believe that God tests us before he trusts us. And really that kind of leads us to our first kind of, our first kind of point there. If you, if you look in your notes there, give me that first one up on the screen there. Before every blessing, there's always a testing. Next slide there. There you go. Before every blessing, there's always a testing. If you want to be used by God, he will test you first. You see, God wants to make sure that you're ready for all that's in store for you. So, what does God test? Well, God tests our character. God tests our faith. God tests our humility. God tests our integrity. God also tests our generosity. God will allow us to go through tough times to see how well can we handle ourselves. He wants to see if when these fire, these, these testing times come into your life, how are you going to make it through? How are you going to handle it? If you pass the test, then guess what? God's going to promote you. Just look at Paul. Look at Paul for instance here. And I didn't put this verse in, in, in your notes. I, I don't know why I didn't put it in. I just glanced over this one, never put it in there. But follow along with me. First Thessalonians 2, 4. Maybe you want to write that passage down or something. But here's what it says. It says, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. You see, oh, I did put it in there. Is it in your notes? Oh, wow, look at that. I am shocked. I'm, I, I was reading through it this morning. I went, oh, I never put that verse in their notes. Oh, oh well, I'll just read it to them. Look at that. I guess I, I'm better at this than I thought I was. All right. Paul, he, he's talking here. He, he's been given the gospel to preach, to teach. And Paul constantly is passing the test. I mean, think about Paul's life. For a Paul is the New Testament Daniel, if you ask me. No matter what Paul went through, stoned, beaten, no matter what it was, Paul passed the test. Why? Because Paul was more concerned with what God thought than what man thought. And that's the same thing we're going to find as we talk today about Daniel. We're going to find that Daniel was more concerned with what God thought than what anybody else thought. Daniel's character was tested time after time after time, and he was approved by God. And he passed those tests time after time after time. And here's a fact that may interest you. Daniel and John, they're the only two, the only two that we know about, the only two that were told how the world is going to end. You see, if you read the book of Daniel, you'll see it's a, really a, a precursor to the book of Revelation that John wrote through the inspiration of Jesus. These are the only two guys that were given the responsibility of writing how the world is going to come to an end. This guy was passing the test. Now, I know if you watch Christian, how many of you knew that the world was supposed to end last night? How many of you knew that? Yeah, oh, some of you knew that, right? So either A, we missed it, or B, I do see a few of our folks missing this morning. I'm a little nervous right now. If I'm being, no, I'm just kidding. They're at the Cranberry Festival. Uh, I know life goes on and life is still going on. Folks, here's the interesting thing. You know, we, we hear all the time. Y years ago, there was a guy who wrote a book, Why Christ is Going to Come Back in the Year 1989. 89 Reasons Why Christ is Going to Come Back in 1989. And 1989 came and went, and then he wrote another book. 90 reasons why God is going to come back in the year 1990, he miscalculated. Folks, listen, man doesn't know. Even Jesus, when he was here on this earth, he says, it's not for me to know the time. 
That's God. God knows. So why then was Daniel given this message? Because Daniel could be trusted. Daniel could be trusted. Let me give you another life principle. Write this down. God tests us with stress before he trusts us with success. God tests us with stress before he trusts us with success. Daniel was promoted five times in his life. This guy faced a lot of stress, folks. A lot of stress. But let me tell you, he passed again and again and again. And each time he passed, each time he passed that test that God laid right out in front of him. So during this series, we're actually going to be looking at all these different tests that Daniel went through and how he passed them. Because here's the thing, we all are going to face those same tests in our life, throughout our lifetime. And through the life of Daniel and seeing Daniel and studying Daniel, we're going to understand how we can overcome these tests also. In the first message last week, we talked about what do we do when our world is turned upside down? This week, we're going to look at what do we do in the face of social pressure? When you're pressured to conform. So Daniel and 25% of the nation, they were taken back as POWs back to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar says, take the best looking, the smartest, the best educated, whatever we can have. We're going to bring them here and then for three years, we're going to indoctrinate these people. For three years, we're going to indoctrinate them into our culture, into our ways. We want to get rid of all, even their old identities. We don't even want them to remember who they are. They're brainwashing all of these kids that they have brought as POWs back to Babylon. He wants to erase their identity, erase their very being. And last week we looked at this passage of Scripture. It's in Daniel chapter 1, verse 7. I want to read it for you again. I think it'll be on the screens there for you. It says, And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Meshach he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. You know, one thing that's really interesting to me, and this is just kind of a side note, I'll throw this one in there for free for you this week. Have you ever noticed that when, when, when we talk about Daniel, we never call him Belshazzar? But when we talk about Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, we call him Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You, have you ever wondered why we do that? Yeah, I have no idea. I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm just, just wondering. I thought maybe one of you would know the answer to the question. I was hoping to get an answer here, all right? So Daniel's name, Hananiah's name, Mishael's name, Azariah's name, these names, all of those names pointed back to God. Their names, you see, back in, in ancient times, in the Bible, when they would name their kid, there was significance behind that name. It wasn't just a name. You know, in, in today's world, we, we, we just give people names, you know. We, we think it's a cool name, so we give them a name. Like, like Milena, for instance, we, we named her. Uh, some of you may remember years ago, it's not actually a show we really even watched. We saw a couple episodes of it, but you may remember there was a show called Average Joe on TV. And it was just this average guy. Oh, somebody's like, yes, I loved that show. It was like my favorite. Somebody even raised their hands on that one. I'm we're going to have, have to have a conversation afterwards about why it was such a good show. But anyways, we, we watched the show. And if you remember, year one, the girl's name was Malena. And we went, oh, that's a really pretty name. We're going to steal that. And so we stole it, and that became our first daughter's name. In ancient times, their names had meaning. And if they came from the Jewish nation, generally their name pointed back to God. Well, Daniel's name meant God is my judge. Hananiah's name meant God is gracious. Mishael's name meant who is like God. And Azariah's name meant God has helped me. But now these, these chief eunuchs, these, these chief priests, they've come in and they're changing their names. Daniel is now Belshazzar. And that name means Bel protects me. Hananiah is now Shadrach, which means after moon God. Mishael is now Meshach, which means Fertility God. And Azariah is now Abednego, which means servant of Nebo. You see, their names now no longer point back to God. Their names point to the Babylonian gods. What are they doing? They're trying to completely indoctrinate these kids. 
have them forget about the God of Israel, the God of Judah. I don't want them to even think about that God anymore. But not only did they change their names, but they also tried to change their diet. Look at Daniel chapter 1, verses 5 and 8. I think it'll be on the screens there for you. You can follow along. It says, The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Now, how many of you, how many of you know what a training table is? Anybody know what a training table is? Anybody play sports? This is something they do in the Olympics and everything else. A training table is basically everybody who's on the Olympic sport team or whatever, they all come to the same table every t- breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They all eat the exact same food. And it's for training purposes and everything else. It's so they can limit their diets and so that they can control what they eat and everything else. So a training table is where they would all come. Well, basically, what you're seeing here in Daniel is a training table. They're training these kids. They're indoctrinating these kids. It was the king's food. Now, I've got to imagine, it's the king's food. It's probably going to be pretty good food. It's probably a pretty good deal. But it says Daniel was resolved that he would not defile himself. What does that word defile mean? It means to corrupt. It means to pollute. It means to contaminate. It means a loss of purity. So why did 15-year-old Daniel say to the most powerful man in the world, I'm not going to eat your food. Why did he say that? Now, he didn't say it like that. But why did he say that? Well, there were actually some reasons why Daniel said that, and I put them in your notes. First of all, it was a health reason. There was a health reason. You see, the king's food actually wouldn't have been that healthy for you. The king's food back in those ancient times would have been with a lot of sauces and a lot of sugars in their food. So it was a health reason. The second was a cultural and national reason. A cultural and national reason. God gave the Jews very strict dietary laws. God gave them what we would call today kosher laws. Why? Because they were a unique nation. This nation was to be set apart. You see, the nation of Israel, the Bible is going to come through the nation of Israel. The Messiah would come through the nation of Israel. They were to be unique, so God set them apart from everything to be this unique nation. But now this test over food for Daniel, and and these guys, really, this whole testing of this whole idea here is really more than just a diet. It represented that they were going to trust God and not trust man. That's what it represented. God had set these laws for the nation of Israel, and Daniel said, we're going to follow God's laws. We're going to follow what God has set for us. We're not going to follow what what the pagans say. We're not going to do that. We're going to follow what God says. Now, there's a third reason. And the third reason was it was a spiritual attack. It was a spiritual attack. If they could get them to eat from a different diet then they would forget their God. They want these guys to forget their God, so they're trying to brainwash these young men by changing their names, by indoctrinating them for three years, by even changing their diet. There's a reason for all of this, folks. A reason. So they're faced, and Daniel is faced with this really big test. So today I want to look at this first big test and see how Daniel faced it and how we can face the same problems today. I want us to look at four qualities that God wants to give into our lives. So if you want God to bless you, you want to be just like Daniel, you want to be promoted like Daniel, then the first test that Daniel had to, the first test that it reveals here is number one, is integrity. He never forgot who he was. Integrity. He never forgot who he was. You know, for Daniel, they could change his name to Belshazzar, but it didn't change who he was. They could change his address. They could try to indoctrinate him. They could do everything that they could think of to this guy, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego too, but they couldn't change their heart. 
Couldn't change these guys' hearts. Look at Daniel 1, verse 8, just kind of that first part. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. They could change his name, they could change his address, but Daniel would not conform to what they wanted him to be. You see, folks, listen. Daniel was a man of integrity. A man of integrity. He would not conform to the world's way of life. He would not conform to what everybody else in the crowd was doing. Look at Romans 12 too. It's in your notes. Romans 12 too says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, folks, you have two choices in life. Either you're going to conform or you're going to be transformed. Those are your two choices in life. Either you're going to be conformed to society and you're going to become just like everybody else. You will look like them, you will act like them, or you'll be transformed and you'll be set apart like Daniel. Set apart from the world. You'll do things that are completely counter-cultural. You see, that's who Daniel was. They took everything from him. But in the face of all of that, he stood with faith and said, I will not conform to the way they want me to be. You see, Daniel had integrity. Folks, listen. If, if you, I, always, I, try, I try to say this every week. If you don't get everything I say this week, get this. We need men and women of integrity today. Don't we? We need men and women of integrity. It's so easy that when, when life crops up on you and everybody around you is acting one way or everybody around you is saying things about you that you're sitting there going, I know that's not true. You know, when people say things about me, I know just aren't true. You know what I want to do? In my mind, I think of all the ways I could lie about them and ruin them too. Am I the only one? No. We all do that, don't we? But if we're going to be men and women of integrity, like Daniel, we have to face it and go on. Pray for those individuals who talk about us like that. You see, we don't have that in our world anymore. We don't have Daniels in our world anymore. We need Christians that will stand in the face of adversity and not conform to what the world wants. We need Christians who will stand up for what the Bible says and live on our biblical principles that God has set for us. You see, we don't do that. Wednesday night we we were talking and and we've been kind of working our way through the book of Revelation on Wednesday night. If you're looking for a small group, uh, 6.30 to 7.30, we've been studying uh, Revelation, I mean Romans, sorry. We've been studying Romans. We, we just started in chapter 5 last year, and uh, we were going to work our way through chapter 8. And I know we took summer off, so don't think, wow, he's really going slow, because we're only in chapter 7. And uh, this last week, I, I posed the question of, what became of sin? Carl Menninger, I don't know how many of you know who Carl Menninger is. Carl Menninger wrote a book, What Became of Sin? Excellent. I've read portions of it. I've actually never sat down and read the entire book, which I really want to. But I've read portions of the book, and I've read quotes from the book and everything else. And so we posed the question on Wednesday night of what became of sin in our world? We don't call it sin anymore, do we? We call it symptoms or mistakes or disease. We call it everything but sin. You see, folks, listen, that's conforming to the world. That's going against the biblical values that God has set for us and, and, and saying, I, I'm just going to fall right in line with the world. I'm just going to conform to what they're doing. Why not? I mean, everybody else is doing it, right? So why not me? Folks, listen, we have got to have integrity. Integrity. But we don't have it anymore. We've lost it. Folks, listen, we need to be men and women who live like Daniel. We've got to have integrity. This test also revealed about Daniel, number two in your notes there. 
is that Daniel had discipline. Daniel had discipline. He controlled his ego and his appetite. Write that down real quick because we're going to jump right into verse 8 again there, the second part. Discipline. He controlled his ego and his appetite. Look at verse 8, the second part there. It says, Daniel made up his mind to not, Daniel made up his mind not to eat the food and wine given to them by the king. Now, I'm sure, once again, that this was some of the best food that anybody could have. I want you to think about this. Daniel showed tremendous discipline in spite of great temptation. I want to ask you a question. If you were a teenager, and some of you are, if you were a teenager and you're offered power, prestige, pleasures, you can have basically everything at your fingertips, serve in the palace with luxury, pampered and given preferential treatment, get the best education, eat the most expensive food, what would you do? You're 15. What would you do? What would you do? I think most of us would take it, wouldn't we? Power, prestige. In our world today, when I was thinking about this this week, I was reminded of NBA players. You know the guys who come right out of high school and go right into the NBA? Do you know what happens to most of those guys? Most of them today, a lot of them today are bankrupt. They have no money left anymore. They've made millions and millions and millions while they were playing basketball. But they never learned anything because they jumped from high, from high school right to college. And some of those basketball players, I think of, of like Kevin Garnett, who ultimately became a great basketball player, right? I mean, Kevin Garnett was a pretty great basketball player. But had he gone to college first, he probably could have been even better. Got some... Because the first few years Kevin Garnett played, he wasn't that good. Even Kobe Bryant didn't even start when he first came in the NBA. Daryl Dawkins, some of these guys that were great NBA players. Because they allowed power, prestige, all these things to go to their head. And it reminded me when I was in high school. I was trying out for the basketball team, freshman in high school, trying out for the basketball team, and I made the varsity team. And I thought, that's really cool. I'm going to be the youngest one on the team, one of the first guys ever in the history of the school to make the varsity team as a freshman. And my dad came to me and he said, son, he says, you could play varsity basketball. And, and I'll, that's fine, that's great. But I think you'd be better off if you went down and started for JV, got some experience, and then 10th grade you go up and then you'll probably start on the varsity team. I didn't want to do that. Who'd want to do that? Come on, I'm on the varsity team. I hardly played the entire season. I got to go in during what we call scrub minutes. We were getting killed, which was every game. And I got to go in at the end of the game. I could have been better, but I let the prestige get to my head. The ego get to my head. You see, Daniel didn't let it control who he was. Daniel said, I'm going to serve you, God. You've placed me here. You've placed me in Babylon. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do what you want, but I'm not going to allow any of this to go to my head. And even though in the face of everything, Daniel stood strong. And Daniel said, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. You see, that's discipline. And that's what honors God. Look at Romans 6.13. It's in your notes. It says, do not let any part of your body become a tool of wickedness used for sinning. It said, give yourself completely to God because you want to be a tool in the hands of God used for his good purposes. And that's the discipline Daniel had. Daniel could have allowed his life to be in the tools of, of, of the pagans. And he could have had all the power and prestige right away because Daniel was a smart dude. Daniel said, I'm going to honor God. I'm going to become a tool in God's hands. He had integrity and he had discipline. Number three. The third thing that it reveals about, that this test reveals about Daniel's number three is courage. He was willing to stand alone. Courage. He was willing to stand alone. Took a great amount of courage for Daniel to ask the most powerful man in the world to exempt him from eating the best food. You see, folks, what you have to understand is that when Daniel said, I'm not going to eat that food, that was an insult to the king. An insult to the king. 
what this even what was even more difficult about this was that he wasn't the only one in this program we know of at least three other friends of his who were in this program but they wanted to stand with daniel but can you imagine that remember 25 percent have come all these other kids can you imagine see we don't hear about any of the other ones why because they fell right in line with the indoctrination process i would assume Can you imagine Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? Maybe there was a few others. And they're sitting at the table and they're eating their fruits and vegetables because that's what they ate. Can you imagine everybody else going, why are you guys doing that? Come on, Daniel, come on. Everybody else is doing it. Why not not do it along with all of us, Daniel? It's not going to hurt you, Daniel, come on. So here's the point. Listen, the majority is often wrong, folks. The majority is often wrong. We don't get to vote on what is right and wrong in this world. Wrong is wrong no matter how many people say it is right. Look at Exodus 23 too. It says, You shall not fall in with the many who de- that do evil, nor shall you bear, bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many so as to pervert justice. Has there ever been a time at work or, or, or somewhere, maybe you're sitting around, standing around the, the, the water cooler, so to speak, and they're talking about values, and you know they're wrong. You know that those values and those things they're talking about are wrong, and you don't ever say anything. Maybe even you join in with the conversation. When I worked in the car business, you can imagine what I had to deal with sometimes there. And I remember one time, all the guys were in one office, and they're all in there just dying, laughing at something that they're watching. So I wanted to know. So I went marching in, and one of the guys turned around and said, Andrew, no, you don't want to see this. You'll be offended by this. And I thought, oh, okay. So I didn't go, and I, and I didn't look at it, and I didn't see it. You see, because I had lived my values, and because I had shown these guys and talked to them about Christ, talked to them about where, how I live life and everything else, they knew my values. So because they knew my values, they didn't even invite me to see something that would totally offend me. I took that as a compliment. I love this verse, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, of the New Living Translation. It says, stand true to what you believe. Be courageous. Be strong. Folks, we need men and women who are going to stand strong and be courageous in this culture that we live in. We need to stand strong for the values we believe in, especially the biblical values. There's a fourth test, and this is it. The fourth test that revealed Daniel's life, number four, is humility. He was tactful with authority. Humility. The way that Daniel made his appeal showed respect for authority. He knew that God has allowed a pagan leader to be his boss. I want you to look at how Daniel made his appeal. Now, I didn't put this in your notes. Well, at least I don't think I did. So I'm just going to read it. Starting in verse 8 in Daniel chapter 1. It's kind of a longer section, so I'm just going to read it to you. I'm reading out of the English Standard. It says, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chiefs of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should, you, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of the same age? So you would endanger my head with the king. So in other words, just by him going and even asking the eunuch, the eunuch, if he takes us to the king, he's in danger, the eunuch is, of even losing his head of being beheaded at this point in time. Then Daniel said to the steward, so Daniel goes to somebody else. I love this. Whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Test your servant for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. So Daniel's just kind of moving up, right? He's just kind of asking everybody who he can think of, hey, let's see what really happens here. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who had ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. It's incredible. They, they did that in 10 days, just so you know, for the most part, in 10 days, you really generally don't see too much of a difference, okay? But uh, they did. Why? 
because God is performing a miracle here. Verse 17, as for these youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Amazing, isn't it? They lived with integrity. And what does it say? Nobody was found like Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, and Daniel. Why? Because they did what God wanted them to do. And they were humble about it. And they had integrity about it. And did you catch what it says? It said they had more wisdom. That Daniel could see and interpret visions and dreams, which we're going to find out later on is going to come real handy. Why? Because they followed God. They followed God. He faced the king at 15 years old. And now when we get to the end of chapter 1, it's already three years later at this point in time. So now he's 18 years old. And I'm sure along that road there were temptations to conform. But Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they stood strong and they kept saying, no, 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 no. We're going to do what God wants. We're going to follow what God wants. And where did it get them? At the foot of the king. At the foot of the king. When everybody else, the majority was telling them no, they said yes. And now, they're the very right hand of the king himself. In this world we live in, folks, we're going to face pressures. Daniel did. Why was Daniel able to overcome this? Because, number one, he had a close relationship with God. He walked with God. He had God's presence in him and God's power and God's protection. He also had close friends who kept him accountable. So let me close with this. Four things that you need to remember when pressured to conform. They're all four are right there. Number one is I have Jesus with me. Number two is I have the Holy Spirit in me. Number three, I have the promises of God to me. And number four, I have God's family around me, which is why it's so important for you to get involved in one of our small groups. To have God's family around you. Daniel stood strong because he had three other friends who also stood strong along with him. Now, I believe Daniel would have stood strong in the face of everybody anyways. But it's a lot easier when you have somebody else with you. Folks, listen. We need Daniels in this world, don't we? Seven more weeks in the life of Daniel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this incredible life of Daniel. God, we have so much to learn from this man who had complete, unstoppable faith. And Father, even when people were lying about him, as we'll find out later, they lied about him. He had integrity. And he did what you asked him to do, God. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Father, these men were men of faith. Thank you, God, for all that you do for us. Help us to be men and women of integrity, of discipline. Help us to have humility, Father, and help us to have courage. Courage in this world, Father. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And let me tell you, all of this that we talked about today is, is awesome, but it's impossible without God. It's impossible without God in your life. And maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, Andrew, today I just want to take that step of faith and say, I want to be just like Daniel. I want to start off here with God and make him Lord of my life because that's where it has to start. If we want to be like Daniel, it has to start with Jesus in our lives. And if that's you, I just want you to pray quietly right where you are, just you and God. Just say, Father, I need your son, Jesus. And right now I'm asking him to come into my life and to save me from all of my sins. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus, who died for me, rose again, so I could have eternal life. 
If you just prayed that prayer, would you just mark that box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ? We're so excited for you. We want to help you on this journey of knowing and understanding what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for Daniel in the Bible who went through some of the hardest times in life and stood strong for you, God. And Father, I don't know about anybody else, but I needed this message this week. When things are tough in life, this is a message we need.